And uh, unfortunately, the first person who threw that allegation at me was my father, who was a leftist, um, a strong supporter and activist in the civil rights movement in the south of the United States in the early 60s, um, and who had brought me up to be a fierce anti-racist and egalitarian. He was opposed to the Vietnam War, and in my family, around my family dinner table in the 60s, that the Vietnam War was an atrocity was just an assumption we all shared from my youngest sibling at the age of eight to me at the age of 15. And this was about what happened in 1967, the Six Day of War, when I was 14 years old. And I'll just read you this from the book and then finish up. <clears throat> in Sunday school, Israel's victory in the Six Day War was a great moment of Jewish pride. I don't remember much thanking of God and no mourning for, no for the victims on either side, just a sustained note of elated triumph. To cap all our other Jewish achievements, to confirm our eminence, we had now proved ourselves masters in war. It had taken us just six days to defeat Arab armies attacking from all sides, to sweep across the Sinai, unite Jerusalem, drive the enemy back across the Jordan. No one spoke then, not in my hearing, of the beginning of an occupation. We had redrawn the lines on the map. That was our prerogative. That was justice. We were unbeatable and we were righteous. Israel married moral virtue and military strength. Another sign that we lived in an age of order and progress that all we wished for would be ours. When a friend who liked to tease me about my anti-Vietnam War views suggested I might not support Israel against the Arabs, I was outraged and offended. I'm not sure exactly when or how I began to doubt, but I remember what happened the first time I expressed that doubt. It was a few months after the June War. A special visitor came to our Sunday school class. He was in his early twenties, with thick fair hair falling over his forehead, a snappy sports jacket, and polished loafers. Some of the girls whispered that he was cute, he had an accent, but it was nothing like our grandparents' accents. He looked and dressed like us. But he had been a soldier in a war, and that made him an alien being. Smiling, he perched himself casually on the <coughs> teacher's desk and told us about the remarkable achievements of the Israeli army. He told us that the Arabs had planned a sneak attack, but had met with more than they bargained for. They were bad fighters, undisciplined soldiers, and they were better off now under Israeli rule. You have to understand these are ignorant people, he said. They go to the toilet in the street. Now something akin to this I had heard before. I had heard it from the white southerners I'd been taught to look down upon. I had heard it from people my parents and my teachers described as prejudiced and bigoted. So I raised my hand and when called upon I expressed my opinion as I had been taught to do. It seemed to me that what our visitor had said was, well, racist. I felt the eyes of the teacher and the other kids turn on me. They were used to me spouting radical opinions, but this time I had gone too far. Angrily, the teacher told me I didn't have any idea what I was saying and that there would be no discourtesy to guests in his classroom. The young Israeli ranted bitterly about Arab propaganda, <coughs> of which I had encountered exactly none at this stage of my life, and how the Israelis treated the Arabs better than any of the Arab rulers did. I can't remember how long it was after that that I decided to share this experience and my thoughts on it with my family. This was something I was usually encouraged to do, and for which I usually received <coughs> approbation. I launched into my story about the Israeli in Sunday school and how what he said was racist. I had been thinking about the matter and now added, for my family's benefit, a further opinion. It was wrong for one country to take over another, or part of another, by military force. If the U.S. was wrong in Vietnam, and that was a given around our dinner table, then Israel was wrong in taking over all that Arab land. I was reasoning by analogy. And nobody had yet told me that some analogies were off limits. For some time, I remained unaware that my father was listening to me not with approval, but with rising fury. When he barked, enough already, the shift was disturbingly abrupt. Like my Sunday school teacher, he made me feel that I'd said something obscene. Then he drew a breath, turned to me, and it seemed to soften. I think you need to look at why you're saying what you're saying, he said. 
and then the softness vanished. There's some Jewish self-hatred there. I felt then, and I still feel now, when I look back on it, deeply and frustratingly misunderstood. My motives had nothing to do with self-hatred or any feeling about being Jewish, nor did they have anything to do with compassion for people, the Palestinians, about whom I knew nothing. I was merely following, as best I could, and in typical 14-year-old fashion, what seemed to be the dictates of logic. If, in following them, the results appeared to defy assumptions, then that just made them more curious and more compelling. Judging people by their color or religion was wrong. Racism, making a generalization about a whole people, stereotyping a whole people, was wrong. Taking over other countries was wrong, even if they attacked you. It was some years before I learned that it was Israel that had launched this war, the 1967 war, justified at the time by Abba Ibn, the American liberal Jew who expanded Israeli, as a preemptive strike. That was the word he used in the United Nations. Among the shibboleths I was brought up on was the belief that my country, right or wrong, was wrong. No one liked to insist more than my dad that if you really loved your country, you criticized its flaws. Surely that it must also apply to religion. And my religion, right or wrong, <coughs> must also be wrong. I was only trying to apply general principles to a particular case. <clears throat> Some might by now have concluded that the roots of my anti-Zionism anti lie in eatable trauma. For sure, this was a deeply distressing incident. Later, I looked back on it as my first political disagreement with my father. Later still, as one of a number of raw episodes in our relationship, most of which had nothing to do with politics. Now, looking again at the history behind the incident, I see more clearly why the opinions I was expressing would have infuriated nearly everyone in my father's milieu in those days. To me, they were a logical development from the shared ground of democratic liberalism. But to liberals of my father's generation, they were an insolent abrogation of that shared ground. Without the least attempt intending to, I had breached a taboo. To stand with this, Reassuring denouement to that sad story is that some years later, in 1982, after the revelations about what the Israelis were responsible for at Sabra and Shatila, I was in London, my dad was in New York, and I got a phone call, and it was my dad. And he had been watching TV and he'd seen what had happened to the refugee camps in Lebanon. And he said, Okay, I give up. You're right, they're bastards. You don't have to be Jewish to know how good that felt. You simply have to be a child, and we all are at one time or the other. And of course, I was immensely delighted that he admitted that he was wrong and I was right. Um, that was a personal bonus, but more importantly, very quietly, and in a milieu where it was not approved of, he began to raise money for what he considered to be moderate, respectable Palestinian causes. And in New York in the 80s, this was and I really admire him for being able to change. And I end with that story because the whole point of my book is that the relationship between Jews and Israel, between Jewishness and Zionism, is not fixed and automatic or natural. It's constructed out of historical struggle, some of which I've reviewed in my book. It wasn't inevitable and automatic that, the, that Zionism would come to dominate the Jewish diaspora. It's something that changed over history. It's something that's changing now, and that's the hopeful part of the story and that my father's own journey illustrates. So I end with that. Thank you very much for your patience.